Let me tell you something. Every day, every moment of your life, you need God's help. Every, there's not a moment in our lives when we do not, when we are not desperate. You understand me? Desperate for God's help. If I were you, I would probably say no less than a hundred times a day, God help me. God help me. Just help me. You don't even have to know what you need help for because I can guarantee you, you need help for something. Just God help me. And I, I, I wish that I could explain the mystery of it to you, but just to sit down. Don't worry so much about what you do when you spend time with God. Well, if I spend time with God, what do I do? Truthfully, and I hope this, you know, is not doctrinally insane, but I don't really think it matters so much what you do. I think the thing that's important is that you have come to him, you're giving him time, and by coming to him, you're saying, I'm afraid to start this day without you. I don't trust myself. I need you. Help me. Strengthen me. Now, obviously, when you add studying the Word to that and, and you learn principles of prayer and confessing the Word, yes, there's a lot of spiritual disciplines that we can practice in that time. But I think that too often people worry about what they're supposed to do. And they have this set formula and they try to follow it every day. And it won't be long and you're going to get really bored with it. But if you follow the Holy Spirit, there will be creativity and variety and you're going to enjoy the time and you're not even really going to know what happened. You just know that you were and God was and there was a connection that you don't understand and now all of a sudden you've got a brighter outlook on the day than you had when you went to spend that time. Let's all be people who really want to bear good fruit. Let's don't be the kind of person that just our whole walk with God is just to get him to give us what we want. Let's be more concerned about what we can give to God, how we can represent him, how we can be an ambassador for Christ. And early in the morning, while it was still dark, he arose and he went and departed to a lonely place and he was praying there. Jesus, he demonstrates for us that to be stirs of revival that even when the whole city is at our door, when there's a need at church, there's a need at work, there's a need with this group of friends, there's a need even over here, everywhere, people are pulling at us and tugging at us and our schedules are busy and full and replete with things to do. Put first things first so that we build margin into our lives so that early in the morning, if that's the best time for you, what that symbolizes is priority. Wherever you need to put it in your life so that you have prioritized intimate time with the Father. Jesus knew, even if everybody is knocking at my door, I'm not going to let everybody else's expectations of me determine what I do with my time. I'm going to have some supernatural priorities. I'm going to put first things first and keep the things that are most important to my Father. I'm going to make sure those things are also most important to me. And when we live with the favor of God in our lives, not resting in our laurels, but resting in his favor that is upon us. And when we have supernatural uh, priorities, when our friends see that when they're busy doing everything for everybody, but we say, you know what, give me a moment so that I can meet with my father to get some clear direction for me and my children and my spouse and my family and my career. When, when they see us prioritizing our relationship with God, when we lift him up in these ways, people will be drawn. Revival will be stirred. A match will be lit. Fire will spread. Folks will want to know, who is this God? I believe that if we totally give ourselves to God, he will give us what we want. It may not be what we thought we wanted, but it will sure make us happy. It will be the thing that nobody else can give us, and we will be so fulfilled. Now... If things seem to be going a different direction than what you want them to go, just say, God, I trust you. Your will be done and not mine. Don't ever be afraid to let God do what he wants to do in your life. That's why I stay on this thing all the time about spending time with God, spending time with God, spending time with God, and realizing that our walk with God is not just a Sunday morning event. 
And the enemy wants nothing more than to keep the people of God from actually experience God, experiencing God outside of church. If he can keep our experiences with God limited to the time we're just corporately gathered together, he's got us right where he wants us. What he does not want, what is dangerous to the kingdom of God is someone who leaves the room like this and actually encounters God in the regular rhythms of their everyday living. If the only time you are soaking in the presence of God is once a week at your home church, I'm so glad you go, but that ain't good enough. If the only time you're in the presence of God is once a week at Bible study, I'm so glad y'all are in Bible study, but that ain't good enough. You've got to have a daily, ongoing encounter and meeting with the presence of God so that His presence becomes your daily portion. And your public life will only ever be as powerful and as successful as your private prayer life. Do you know what's going to compel people to come to this God that we serve? It's when you go back home or back to your job or back to that organization where you know the task to which you have been assigned. You're the underdog. You're not as smart as they are. You don't have as much skill as they do. You don't have as much talent as she does. And yet somehow by the power of almighty God that marks your life, you do not shrink back in fear and insecurity, passing off the task to somebody else. But you believe that if God has called you to it, he He's going to equip you for it. And you step into the gap and you fill the space in the power of Almighty God. When the world sees us operating, y'all, with supernatural ability, the world will take note that there's got to be a God that we serve that is giving us this kind of confidence. Not confidence in our own flesh, but confidence in the power of God to operate in our weakness. One of the main ways we're going to see the power of God in our own experience, I'm talking about where the, this God that was powerful enough to divide the Red Sea in the Old Testament, powerful enough to raise Lazarus from the dead in the New Testament, one of the ways we're going to see this God of the Bible leap up off the page and actually experience him in a tangible, real, practical way in our lives. Do you know when that happens? It happens when you're in a position that you're in over your head, it is beyond you. You know you're not capable. You don't have enough time. You don't have enough money. You don't have enough patience. You don't have enough ideas. You don't have enough creativity. You're not gifted enough, talented enough, and yet you excel by the power of God. It's when he takes you into a position where you know you can't do it in your natural resources. And he gives you his resources to complete the task. Here's the trouble with us. When we're compelled to do something for which we know we are outmatched, we let fear talk us out of doing it. Which means we let fear talk us out of an opportunity to experience God. I want to compel you and encourage you that if you've been shrinking back in insecurity from a task to which you know you have been called, but you've been passing it off to somebody else who you think is more suited for the task, I want to ask you to consider the fact that that exact opportunity is the way he plans to demonstrate his power through you. It's the way he intends for everybody else in your office to want to know about this God that you serve. It's the way he intends for the people that are on your university campus or, or are in that organization or that ministry in which you're involved. This is the way where he will draw attention to himself. He will glorify himself when we step into the places for which we are not capable in our own natural talent and ability. I have a friend who puts it this way. We pray for miracles, but then in the next breath we pray and say, Lord, please keep me out of any situation in which a miracle would actually be required. Everybody wants to see the Red Sea divided, but nobody actually be, wants to be the one that's face to face with the Red Sea. Everybody wants to see the walls of Jericho come tumbling down, but nobody wants to be the one who actually has to walk around those walls in obedience to God's word. We want to see miracles, but nobody wants to be in a place where we have to see miracles. When you've been compelled to do something for which you know you are outmatched, but you know God's spirit is compelling you to do it anyway, this is your opportunity to see the power of God on display. If he's called you to the Red Sea, that means he intends to divide it. If you'll just show up, hold out your rod and expect that great supernatural things are on the way.